the reluctant Beatle, George Harrison, from the author of the million copy selling shout, The Beatles in Their Generation, uh, comes a revealing portrait of George Harrison, the most undervalued and mysterious Beatle. Delighted to be joining me uh, live on the line, uh, Philip Norman himself. Philip, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks, thanks for joining us. It's time, isn't it, for a major re-evaluation of George Harrison as, just on the evidence of that track alone, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, as one of the guitar gods of his generation, in a generation that had Clapton, Hendrix, Beck, you name it. Absolutely. Um, and uh, he himself uh, only thought he was an OK guitarist, and so... Um, on that particular track, which of course is absolutely uh, one of the one of the the classics that he finally managed to contribute to the Beatles, um, he had his friend Eric Clapton play the the main you know the the, the riffs, um, although he could have done it himself obviously, but he was always um, he was really fighting for notice in the studio, and one of the ways he got a little of notice from the other Beatles was to arrive with Eric Clapton to make that track. And they had been rather indifferent to that song before, but with Clapton there, they got interested in the track. So, in fact, it came through as a an amazing Beatle track with the, the very bleak piano intro as well, which is actually more dramatic in a way even than the lead guitar. Yeah, the interesting thing as well is if, if you think of the evolution of the Beatles, they start off... As a phenomenon, obviously, but they start off as 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 a pop group in the same way you know, the Beach Boys are, that the Hollies are, that Herman's you know Herbert's Herman's are. The, the, you don't get an awful lot of guitar solos in in a pop band. Well, George, all the way through, of course, he joined the Beatles when they were called the Quarry Men, and uh, he was very unusual in being able to play these sort of complicated guitar licks. Um, that was in the skiffle days, the rather primitive, primitive days of skiffle music. Um, and George could always work out these solos and these licks. That was his value. Still didn't get him the sort of, particularly the respect of John Lennon. He used to say, who's that bloody kid hanging around? Because he, John was two years older. Um, and the, the the interesting thing is, though, because you have such a phenomenal pairing of, of McCartney and Lennon, Lennon you know, rhythm and McCartney on bass, and they're doing the majority, well, pretty much 99% of the writing because their, their, their output is, is quite something else. But it's, it's rhythm and bass driven songs with obviously Pete Best at first and then Ringo Starr really providing that, that engine room sound. That's true. Um, and George did vocals as well. I mean, he really played a full part in, in the group. Um, but how he was always kind of overlooked and sidelined and he felt this very much um, and he hated her. I mean I call him the reluctant Beatle he wasn't a reluctant musician at all but he hated it when the screaming the Beatlemania started yeah. and his guitar work was being drowned by this awful noise because no one was listening to the music an interesting one as well, and I hadn't really thought about this before until I started reading the sort of the notes on the book. But when we think of of the Beatles, we, you know, we think of Hamburg and then doing all those gigs, and and Lennon as being rough and ready, and and they're all from Liverpool. But Lennon and McCartney are from rather nice sort of semi detached, straight detached houses in in, in Liverpool. Whilst um, George wasn't, was he? He was very much, I mean, re from the real Liverpool working class, his dad was a, a corporation bus driver. Um, and he lived in a, a, actually a new housing estate, um, which to John's snobbish Aunt Mimi, the, the aunt who brought John up, that was like, you know, the seventh circle of hell. And for the first time, really, George felt discriminated against for the way he spoke. Paul McCartney's dad was in, you know, was a commercial traveller for the cotton industry, and they they lived in a council house as well. The McCartneys and um, uh, Jim McCartney, his dad, after Paul's mum died, brought up two boys there. But um, because Paul's mother had been a nurse under the mysteries of the English class system, nurses were honorary middle class. So it was really George who was the sort of the truly, you know, from the true Liverpool working class and. And there are no better people in this world, but he did suffer from a certain amount of snobbery, yes, in those early days. 
And also, it's it's the age thing um, because if you're a, if you're a nineteen year old or if you're a seventeen year old, then a fifteen year old is from a different planet. And you know, boys can be. I mean, we all say, oh, boys are you know, you know, girls can be quite cruel, but boys can be cruel as well, especially when they you know they're a few years older and you're you know you're the you're the you're the you're the runt of the litter, as it were. Yes, well, it, the, the true runt of the litter when he came along was Ringo, um, but in fact, George. Uh, uh, looked very, very young. You know, he was really only 14 when he started to be the lead guitarist. And he looked absurdly young. He had a very large, actually very expensive and rather very prestigious guitar. But he looked absurd, you know, absurdly young holding this very big guitar. And so John did feel that this was a kid and carried on feeling that for a long time afterwards. If you if you think about his look, even then he's you know he's introverted. He's he's not throwing guitar shapes, is he? He's not giving. He's not he's not putting out that sort of raw masculine sexuality that that, that McCartney was, that Lennon certainly was. Um, and so he looks more thoughtful, more introverted. And, and again, in a pop group, which they are at this point, although you know a, mul- a multi million selling one, that again you're going to you're going to look different, and therefore perhaps not come to the fore in the same way. Well, he's a massive contradiction because he's, he's, his nickname is the Quiet One. But everybody who knew him most for most of his, his life said he really never stopped talking. And Michael Palin couldn't understand why he was ever called the Quiet One because George, he said, my mind, George never stopped talking. Uh, but he has a massive contradiction in so many ways. Now he's, <clears throat> he does a, a fantastically noble act uh, later on in uh, really organizing the first charity pop concert, which is for the new state of Bangladesh, and which is the first indication that rock musicians are something more than just um, greedy egomaniacs. Um, But in the next minute, he's seducing Ringo's first wife, Maureen. He's going really from the very height of nobility to the depth of sleaze. but when he's um, when he learns to meditate, in fact, he's the only person I've ever heard of who actually got more moody and temperamental and neurotic after he learned to meditate. His wife Patty, his first wife Patty, said he was sweet until he learned to meditate. I mean, you, I mean, you could argue that that whole meditation thing in the sixties—they're doing it because it's it's the thing to do. I mean, I think you know, Lennon and McCartney were—they were, paid lip service to, but they must have been thinking, you know, what are we doing out here? And yet, yes. and yet, you know, George, I mean, it would have been very easy for George to to write sort of substandard Lennon McCartney tracks, but he goes off and he, on, on his own on his own path and, and writes these really personal. Songs, and I don't mean really personal in the, in the way of perhaps Julia or you know, or Girl or something like that, but you know, songs that sort of reflect the experiences he's going through. Um, but, you know, it does. Uh, with it does. It, yes, it's much more sort of indirect, but with a great deal of passion, particularly when he does embrace you know uh, Indian classical music and Hindu philosophy. Um, but of course, that is what really gives him his first edge. Um, against this sort of creative dynamo of John and Paul. Um, but because when they do an Indian sounding track, then George brings in Indian musicians. And he has his, you know, and, and George Martin, the great producer that they had, were very lucky to have. Except that Martin was so taken up with this extraordinary partnership of Lennon and McCartney that it turned out songs, I mean, just so easily and so fast. He never really sort of, he said, I he always felt guilty because he was rather beastly, as he put it, to George. When you look at the beginnings, as he starts to come through, if you look at, because I'm, I'm, as I get older, I get more fascinated, not by, by Pepper, but by Rubber Soul and by a Revolver. And you can see it, you can see it on... If I needed someone, which is there's, there's hints of of birds like guitar or Indian guitar there, and then you go into Revolver, and you've got tracks like Taxman, and Taxman, it, the, the the stabbing guitar in that hadn't really been. I mean, the Kinks maybe, but it, it's it's quite something. But also, of course, that bears the contradiction in George. He wrote, later on he makes a, a, an album railing against the materialism, as he called it, the material world. And yet here he is writing the first pop song complaining about income tax. Wherever you look, there is a, there are two faces of George looking back at you. So how was he reconciling 
what happened with the Beatles? Because you can take the Beatles as a, as a metaphor for for the sixties, can't you? That that fresh faced innocence. Mm. Then you have the mysticism. Then you have the introduction of of various substances, and then you have this sort of at the end, it's this implosion with Apple, etc. And the dream becomes a nightmare, and they all go their, their separate ways. And and George's decides to go pretty much his own way and, and and do his own thing, but become, if you like, quietly in the background, apparently, the musician's musician. That's right. And, of course, uh, he, he he really sort of blossoms uh, when the Beatles are breaking up and, uh, and after they break up, because it has, although it looks from the outside like being the most heavenly life, to be one of the Beatles, the four most blessed beings, perhaps, of the 20th century, um, on the inside for George, it's all full of frustration, being sidelined, being overlooked, and having writing lots of songs with no songwriting partner like John and like Paul have. Um, he has to do it on his own and go in front of this star chamber and very often have them rejected or such indifference that he withdraws them. Of course, he has a mass of material <laughs> Um, when he starts making his, his solo de- album debut, which is a three a three disc uh, set called All Things Must Pass, and it's really full of songs that have been rejected or or that he hasn't bothered to submit because he's so used to rejection. And I and I remember that my parents had that 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 those it was in a box set. It was as you'd call now three albums, and that front picture with him and the garden gnomes. I mean. It's it's and presumably that's is that on in his estate is that shot in the that picture in the that that's that was yes this this huge goth folly of a house called Friar Park everything is sort of on a, on the theme of friars uh, in the house even the light switches are friars faces and you tweak the nose to tw- switch <laughs> the light on and off um, but that picture of him in rubber boots of course he loved he he, he was passionate about gardening. Um, and he wanted to be remembered more than a garden, more as a gardener than a musician. Um, and uh, in fact, he, well, Pat, his first wife, Patty Boy, wasn't allowed to pick flowers in the, that, that huge garden full of flowers. He says it's robbing the garden. She had to she had to order flowers from the from the florist in Henley, Henley rather than pick them in her own garden. <laughs> and the whole situation with the, the concert for Bangladesh. I mean, this is 1970. Most rock stars are are burnt out. You know, Lennon's gone off with Yoko. He's he's, he's about to have the the lost weekend for two and a half years. Everybody else is is getting sort of carried. It's, it, it, he's a contradiction because at one point he's doing these you know these these fantastic acts, but at the same time he is having this rock and roll lifestyle. You mentioned the sleaze. He has some issues with various substances as well, and Absolutely. and and we have the you know and we have the fa- the. And please confirm if it is a, an urban myth or not. But this guitar duo, uh, this guitar duel uh, over his wife with Clapton. That's right. Yes, it's um, the, uh, Clapton's his best friend. Clapton eventually, his best friend, goes off with George's wife. Um, the strange thing is that after that, Clapton has been totally infatuated with Patty, George's first wife. Um, but with Clapton, once he 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 actually succeeded in enticing any woman into his clutches. He then totally lost interest in her. And so the friendship between George and Eric deepened after Eric had run off with George's wife. Only rock, match, super macho rock stars could do that. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting one because obviously Clapton is in the middle of, you know, a pretty correct me if I'm wrong, a pretty sort of vicious heroin addiction as well. So he's he's doing that, you know, I want something, I've got it, and now I'm going to cast it aside. It was the same with a car, with a guitar, or anything like that. Um, and of course, he, he, died, he is off heroin, but then he goes into alcoholism for 18 years, so Patty hasn't really, you know, found any better situation, really. Um, but she's still, she, George has always been her first love, even though, you know, that marriage ended in unhappiness and bitterness. She never. Re- he was George. Was I think the love of her life. Harrison's out there, and he, he's he's crafting these albums, and he's also getting involved in other, you know, arts, you know, arts and craft. I mean, he's he, he was a massive Formula One fan, and I'm I'm a petrol head, so you know, he he was often cited at you know Grand Prix during the eighties and and and, and th- that period as well. But also handmade films. <laughs> 
he gets involved. He saves Monty. He he saves one of the one of the the best the best loved, most controversial, most quoted movies of all time. That's right. He he's far more multi-dimensional than even John. John was more than a musician, obviously, but George had more sort of sides to him, like the F one fan. Um, yes, uh, the, he became sort of by default really a film mogul, and that film company handmade in the end produces some of the major sort of film successes of the 1980s in British cinema. So oh, he he then comes back with the album in the in, in the 80s, you know, Got My Mind Set On You and Hysterical Video, etc. Um, again, he didn't need to do it commercially, but was he presently surprised that it became a massive commercial hit? Or was, did he do you well, think it was time to reinvent himself? No, no, he did. He, he needed his money terribly. He did. Um, and one of the things that saved him was the Beatles anthology, which he had no nostalgia about. He hadn't been the Beatles in the Beatles, but um, uh, that the huge success of this series of albums, of uh, the Beatles anthology, came at just the right moment because his business partner in the film company had actually left him saddled with all the, all the debt for all the films that hadn't been a success at the box office, and he was actually. He was very, very pleased, really, by, you know, he might got my mind set on you being a surprise hit. And he was ready, really, to, he, he was ready for another round of success when, unfortunately, his uh, his health uh, yeah. broke down and, and he and had it, the terrible experience of being attacked in his own home yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, there was the Wilburys as well, wasn't there, which was this, the, 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 the Travelling Wilburys, which was... Oh, which he loved, because, of course, they were completely democratic. They shared everything. There was no ego. There was no jostling for position in there, the way there had been in the Beatles. So that was, re you know, he discovered really the pleasure of playing in a band again, if he'd ever had it, yeah. um, with the Travelling Wilburys, of course. And somebody once said that was, that was Jeff Lynne's I Want to Be a Beatles project, but, I mean, it was short-lived, but, my goodness, some of the stuff that come out of there really... And, you know, ahead of all the the sort of the MTV Unplugged and, and the, the sort of super groups and getting together acoustic things that we saw later on, getting back to the roots... Yes. Absolutely, yeah. The attack, I mean, that it was ghastly. It was, and I, I think it's been kind of brushed over, but it was, you know, it was, he, he very nearly died. He, you know, his he wife... He 40 times, it's very near the heart. Yeah. Um, and, and by, you know, it was, he almost became the second Beatle to be assassinated. Um, and again, it was by a, cra a crazed fan who thought in some twisted way that George had sold out the ideals of the Beatles. That's what Mark David Chapman said about John Lennon as well. Uh, he did recover from that, but he re wasn't ever really the same after that. And um, the, the cancer that seemed to be in remission did come back then. Yeah. And, and there, was, you know, there was no remission. So when you come to, to, to write something like this, because obviously you've covered this, 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 um, this subject before, this whole, you know, the whole Beatles phenomenon and what happens after with various members. How difficult is it to, to get away from cliche and, and cause you, everybody thinks they know the Beatles. And ever since the, the film came out as well a couple of years ago, even more so, you know, there's fascinating insights. But, you know, George still, because he didn't play, because he didn't, sort of really run off and do the whole rock star life in full public view, shall we say. He still remains somewhat of an enigma. I mean, I remember when he died, the, one of the tablets saying, oh, you know, he was, his ashes were scattered within sort of 24 hours of him dying and he, he should have had this funeral in Liverpool, but he, he, he'd moved on from that, hadn't he? Well, yes, it was very typical. He managed to give the fans a slip, even in death. Uh, they were waiting, it was in, on the banks of the Ganges, Hundreds, thousands of people were waiting to say farewell to George with his ashes being scattered. But he was, his ashes were scattered over two other rivers um, and nobody knew about. That was a very typical exit of George. When you come to write this, do you go back to original sources? Do you go back to interviews you've done over the years? Or do you speak to well, people? Well, inevitably you do, because over the years I met lots of people like George Martin, like Neil Aspinall, the roadie, who was a great ally of George's in, in these years when he was sort of really sidelined and underappreciated. Um, but really the, the story here was you had to keep Lennon and McCartney to one side and concentrate on George and the way really in which he was kind of shortchanged, you know, and was not appreciated um, and, how, and the struggle that he had to come to any prominence within the Beatles and the tremendous, huge success, of course, after as a solo performer.
And that's perhaps the thing, because the music will live on, and that three-box set with him and the Garden Gnomes is iconic, and every time I revisit it, I find something from something new. It's, it's a true artist you know, being let loose. Uh, that's true, and also, the, the, he didn't write as many songs as John and Paul, who wrote, of course, dozens, um, but the best of his do compete with the best of theirs. The book is called Juris Harrison, The Reluctant Beetle. It's by Philip Norman, who is speaking today. Philip, if people want to find more about what, what you're up to, do you do, you do the do you do the social media or the internet thing? No, I don't at all, no, no. Um, um, I follow Dr. Johnson's um, saying that nobody but a blockhead ever wrote for anything except money. Uh, well... <laughs> I will. Well, thank you for that one because I will. I, I will absolutely store that one in my own my own bank. The book is called George Harrison, The Reluctant Beetle. It's by Philip Norman. Philip, I know you're busy. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. My pleasure. Thanks very much.